Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is a very rainy Thursday, April 4th here in Annapolis. In this episode, we're going to talk about the Navy's littoral combat ships. First, today's episode is brought to you by Valletta Industries. Valletta Industries is a premier maritime and tactical training company founded and comprised of former U.S. Navy SEALs. They offer best-in-class trainers for the Department of Defense and local law enforcement. The Valletta team has a passion for instructing and continuing to support the mission of active duty personnel and first responders by lending their hard-earned experience to those brave Americans who still serve. If you're a government contractor looking for a great partner for your next project, Valletta Industries is an SBA certified hub zone and SDVOSB company. Valletta Industries, we solve problems. To learn more, go to valettaindustries.com. Okay. Here at the Naval Institute, we've got a couple of uh, exciting events coming up. On Wednesday, 24 April, in the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center, we'll have a panel discussion on warrior women at 1400, inspired by the new Naval Institute press book, From Yeomanettes to Fighter Jets, A Century of Women in the U.S. Navy. The event features a panel of distinguished female naval officers and seeks to offer a range of historical and present-day perspectives on women's naval service. Don't miss it. And on the 8th of May, we'll host our annual meeting starting at 1600 Eastern Time. We'll recognize essay contest winners and our authors of the year. We've invited Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Eric Smith, to be the keynote speaker. Both events will be broadcast live. If you can't get to Annapolis, go to usni.org forward slash events to find out more. Now, let's get to our guests. Joining me today from San Diego is Rear Admiral Ted LeClaire. Deputy Commander, Naval Surface Force, Pacific Fleet, and Director, Task Force Littoral Combat Ship. And we also have Captain Mark Crawford. He's the commander of LCS Squadron 1 in San Diego, and Captain Mark Haney, commander of LCS Squadron 2 in Mayport, Florida. Gentlemen, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Bill. It's great to be here. So I got I to gotta say, uh, in February, I was in San Diego. We we're out there for West, and I saw several independence class LCS has come and go past the the Bayfront Hilton there. They are very cool looking ships. Yes, sir, they are, and they're big. The independence variants, 418 feet long. And I think when someone gets in a mission bay in one of those, I don't think they realize just how monstrous that mission bay is and that flight deck, it's uh, it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, the flight deck especially is, is ginormous. And uh, I, I got a chance to, I went over to visit uh, our author of the year from two years ago, uh, who's the OPSO on one of the DDGs. And as I was walking on the naval base there, I walked astern of several of the independence class ships, and they look like Klingon battleships or something. I mean, you know, looking through the, the trimaran, uh, you know, sort of catamaran design there, that's a, also a very unique perspective on, uh, you know, looking at a ship. I haven't had as much time around the Freedom class ships yet. Uh, but I would, you know, love to get a chance to visit one uh, if it comes up here to Annapolis to, you know, at some time, uh, you know, maybe this summer, oftentimes ships come up to uh, to give midshipmen tours and those kinds of things. But yeah, these these are these are pretty capable ships as as you are learning, I think. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. And the Freedom variant is also big. I mean, it's 378 feet long um, and then itself has got a very large mission bay. Uh, the cool thing about Freedom is the stern is much lower to the water, so there's an awful lot of flexibility with the crew to be able to do things. Just both of them, just by their sheer size, and I would say the cavernous of them is significant. I think anybody who's listening to the podcast who grew up on a sprue can or a DDG or a, even a cruiser or a frigate, most of those were really spoken for. There was very little space to do anything where these ships, again, uh, and Commodore Crawford has got a great line about um, – uh, it's not a flaw, Mark. What was the phrase you used? It's a uh... yes, sir. Talking about the uh, you know, there are a lot of aspects about the ship that are features, not flaws, and yeah. um, and it really adds to the ship. I mean, the ships are fast, they're agile, and they're nimble. But it's not just from a a movement standpoint, but the manner in which we can quickly. Uh, add on modules uh, in the modularity of the ships in the network that allows us to bring capability uh, to our ships 
and uh, take it out into the sea space in a much quicker uh, manner than what the legacy fleet can experience. And so if there's a new technology, if there's a new innovation that we want to go out there and employ in a, in a rapid manner, then, then LCS is your huckleberry. All right, I, I want to, before we jump into some questions, I just want to state up front uh, for, because there's a lot of people, when we talk about LCS, or when we publish about LCS in proceedings, we get a lot of uh, page views, we get a lot of comments, right? <laughs> and uh, today's show, we're not relitigating the programmatics of how we got to where we are. Uh, there were a lot of decisions made by a lot of former leaders, uh, including, um, you know, members of Congress, uh, some good, some bad. That's not what we're talking about today. We're really talking about what are the ships doing now? What are their capabilities and how are you employing them? So, uh, Admiral LeClaire, I'll just start with you. So, paint us a picture of the employment of LCS on each coast. So, you got the Independence variant ships on the West Coast, Freedom variant on the East Coast. How is the Navy employing them and what, what value are you seeing? Yeah, I think the the most the easiest thing I could say up front is we're we're deploying them in a traditional fashion. Um, they have a typical OFRP cycle. Um, we train a crew or multiple crews. Uh, the ships on the West Coast right now, the Independence variant, they are still uh, well. The, the, there's various places of of status the ships are in, but most of the ships are still in a blue gold status. So a ship that's deployed to Singapore right now. Uh, could be there for two years, two and a half years, and we rotate the crew back and forth. That other crew that's off the hull is being trained here in San Diego, and it's an incredible littoral combat training facility that we have called the LTF, and then we would send that crew out. And that ship in Seventh Fleet operating under Desron 7 is doing a whole host of missions, whether it's uh, cooperative deployments with other nations or it's doing sea control or presence operations. They're doing everything. Uh, now, when you talk to people in the Pentagon or we think about programmatics, the independence variant, the West Coast ships, they are they are really focused on building that capability around MCM. So we're going to start deploying those ships next year to Bahrain so we can decommission the old legacy systems that are the Avenger class. So many of the listeners, I'm sure, were on the Avenger class. Um, but it's not just that ship. It's also the MH-53. And those two are the main components of that legacy system cost hundreds of millions in the billions that we need to then programmatically put back into the Navy. On the East Coast, the Freedom variant that Commodore Haney has uh, out of Mayport, those ships are primarily focused on SUW, the SUW mission area. Often they've been deployed to Fourth Fleet, but we just had a ship come back from Fifth and Sixth Fleet that operated uh, in Fifth Fleet with Task Force 59 as a mothership, did a lot of very interesting experimentation around that concept. I, I don't typically like the phrase mothership because I tell people these are warships that can do MCM, but first and foremost, they're warships. They can do anything a fleet commander wants. And so here at SurfPAC, we are focused on getting the ships manned, trained, and equipped based on programmatics. But really, when you put these ships in the hands of sailors and the fleet commanders, it is amazing what they can do. And I think what we'll do with Commodore Haney and Crawford is talk more about what they are doing and I think what they can do. I think what's really important for your listeners, though, um, is that we have these ships today. They are commissioned. They are operating. We have a few more to commission. Uh, uh, Kingsville is going to commission this August. Uh, which I hopefully will attend because it's going to it's named for a, a key state in Texas, Kingsville, which is King Ranch. There's a lot of history in the state I'm from now. Um, and then Pierre uh, Nantucket is also I'm a you and Bill we're New Englanders, so Nantucket will be commissioned soon. Uh, so as we bring these ships online, we're not talking about things five ten years from now. We're talking about things we can do today, and we'll get into a little bit about payloads and about capability uh, more, but really it's the traditional things that you would think a U.S. warship would do, uh, but then there's some uniqueness around MCM and the need for us to to uh, decommission from the old legacy systems. Okay, uh, that's a good segue to, uh, so we'll start with Captain Crawford then. The, um, so LCS modular platform with some flexibility in how it's employed, uh, we know there's been experimentation with the LCSs and, uh, as the Admiral just said, and USVs. Um, and late last year, USS Savannah uh, conducted an experiment with the containerized SM6 missile system. So talk about some of those trials and how the Navy's employing LCS in ways that might be different from 
perhaps when it was first brought online, if you go back, you know, six, eight, ten years ago. Yeah, Bill, it's uh, when you look at what ships like USS Savannah uh, did last October, launching an SM6 off of their flight deck, uh, utilizing an Aegis weapon system in a box, and and you know we talk about the the nimbleness and the agility and the modularity, and and this was just another example of that, to where we were able to put uh, essentially a Mark 41 VLS system on the flight deck of uh, Savannah, and then go out and experiment. And, and oh, by the way, that wasn't the first time we did that. We did it the year before off USS Tulsa. And 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 so over the course of 15 months, we, we launched two pretty high-end uh, surface-to-air missiles um, against uh, targets. And, and the experimentation piece uh, is huge because we're able to leverage off-board systems. Uh, and when I talk about off-board systems, I'm talking about um, you know, overhead, uh, but I'm also talking about UAS systems that are uh, not fire scout. And, and, and the, oh, by the way, those UAS systems are coming from LCS and, and able to establish data link capabilities uh, with not just with the ship, but with the mocks ashore and then plug into the joint fires network. And so now you see that LCS is not just a, a tool for the Navy component commander, but for the joint force commander. And and I think that's tremendous. And and so we we see the sea space as our playground and uh, the LCS and the ability to operate there. And so we're, we're looking forward to getting the uh, the MCM mission package uh, next month. And uh, we're gonna get that on board USS Canberra. And, uh, and we'll be exercising that as we get them ready for uh, their deployment to fifth fleet next year. And uh, and we continue to to leverage these innovations that are coming uh, from the technical uh, sector to to gain us tactical advantage in, out in the uh, area of operations. Hey, uh, and Bill, let me add about that. So Mark Commodore Crawford said experiment, but let's be clear with your listeners: we could put those launchers, as many as we could buy from Lockheed Martin tomorrow, on those ships and put missiles in them, and they'd be fully operationally capable immediately. So this isn't something we could do years from now. We could put as many of those as you want, and we, and we have a number, I don't wanna probably say on this net, but we know what we think we could put on there. It's just a function of how quickly we could buy them. And we've already been having those conversations. So um, it's not something we tried and it's nifty and we could, but we could scale this to provide uh, any combatant commander long range fires. Um, but as you know, and I'm sure your listeners know, one of the challenges that we face is the number of missiles we have. So, yeah. you know, OK, we prove we could shoot SM6. We, we probably wouldn't maybe put a lot of those on there, but maybe Tomahawk's another option. And so it, it really uh, and here's the key. We could put them on there in two days and we can uninstall it. We did it in 18 hours. That's how quickly we took the system off. And then NAVC did full inspections. There was no damage to the flight deck, no damage to any of the hull, because again, it's aluminum hull. There was concerns about cracking, nothing. And so that's that's a test case. I mean, so, okay, you want long range fires on these ships? I mean, so anyhow. Yeah. So that's so pl plug and play. SM6, was that in uh, a, a ASUW role or air to air or both? Uh, we used it in a both. Uh, it was a uh, dynamic environment that we could have used it in a ASUW role or a AAW role. Yeah, and yeah. that, and then by the way, that launcher is a program of record from the Army. So again, well, one of the things we're trying to do with both variants, and it's for the audience too, it's the LCS class, but we have two variants and they're really very different. I mean, if you think of the world of cars, you know, one is a, uh, um, One's a, a Rivian and the other's like a, a Cadillac. Ferrari? I mean, they're just, oh. Yeah, they're just, oh. they're just, they're really very different. Uh, well, in the, in, the, in the General Motors world, you know, you could build one SUV and they could all have the same frame, but then have different finishes. And so you get all these different brands. But these two ships are very, very different in how they're built. One's steel, one's aluminum. They're just, you know, they happen to be called LCS, but they're just very, really different. Yeah. Makes my head hurt when it, rather than calling them different classes, you call them different variants. But but that. But but yeah. they're but they're all small service combatants, and we as yes. a Navy have a requirement for 56 small service combatants. And I think one of the mistakes we make at times is we can compare it to a DDG and what it's not. That's one. Yeah. Right. And number two, um, 
I think most of the people think that when the ASW mission package failed um, and that we limited ourselves to, oh, it's just going to do MCM, that people started to lose this interest in the platform. But again, when you look at any any Navy around the world, European, NATO nation, that might have a capability that we could scale and put on the ship quickly. That's how you need to think about these ships, not what they aren't, but what they can be. And I think it's just really a limit to our imagination. Um, and that is one of the values of them, as Mark said. It's not a flaw, it's a feature. And, it, and, and, and I think it's talked about a lot now that things are happening so quickly that our fit up, our, our five year defense plan cycle is not just well developed for those new technologies. And by the time we scale something and get it to the fleet, it's almost out of date because something new has come along. And LCS gives us the option to make those changes very quickly. So whoever wants to jump on this question, uh, talk about the, the the way the ships are being crewed. The Admiral, you, you mentioned that some of them are still blue and gold. Some of them are going to, to single crew. Uh, Commodore Haney, you're, you're nodding your head if you want to you know, take that question first. Absolutely. Uh, so for the East Coast, the Freedom variant, though we're having that same discussion about changing them to classes just to make it easier uh, to align. We've gone to single crew over the last year. We see that as a great benefit uh, as far as ownership of the platform, as well as learning for the sailors, dedication to knowing their ship and then maintaining and then operating that ship. That puts us in a traditional OFRP type six, seven month deployment, which we think is ideal. Uh, Indianapolis now on deployment at Fifth Fleet has been there over a year and will be there till the end of the year, uh, but that'll be our last blue and gold deployment. Uh, we're also in line with single crewing. We've increased the number of sailors on board. So originally minimally manned, blue and gold crewing, now looking more traditional crewing concepts that also enable maintaining the ship in a more traditional manner. So uh, right now, I know one of the one of the Concerns has always been contractors and reduced uh, capability of the sailors on board. We're trying to deliver ASABO and increase reliability of the platform by putting more of the sailors and maintainers on board uh, so they can uh, deliver that ship and keep it at sea longer. Uh, and then with that comes a whole uh, change in the idea of the platform of going forward with training the sailors in a more traditional manner so they get similar schooling that a DDG sailor gets so they know their equipment can maintain it and do corrective maintenance on deployment and then and also providing them the tools and the equipment and parts and pieces on board uh, to maintain that equipment longer so all trying to deliver additional increases in ace bow to the fleet commander so uh the for the freedom class originally built to have a crew of how many uh 73 Okay. And then right now uh, we've gone up to 94 and eventually uh, looking to go to 112. Uh, and we're also looking at increasing racks on board to be able to house those sailors on board, along with the air debt that comes. And for a lot of our fourth fleet deployers, uh, the lead debt, the, the Coast Guard lead debt that deploys as well. So is there space in, uh, in the birthing spaces to add racks or you got to move them into mission? You know, it, it, do you have to expand the birthing areas or is there just more room to put them in there? Uh, we're looking at the easiest is to move two man state rooms to three man and uh, okay. also uh, increasing some racks. So we definitely have space to do that uh, right now. You know, modularity, any mission you need to meet, a lot of times we'll put a birthing module on board the ship to increase the manning or multiple. And sometimes for missions, I know right now, uh, or we recently we've flown out a additional birthing module to give additional capability to support a specific mission set in theater uh, when, say, you know, a soft team or a Coast Guard team or another type of uh, special mission type team shows up that the ships need. Uh, we can very rapidly flow that in to provide that additional growth and then take it off as well as their equipment. Right. We talked about flexibility. Uh, Indianapolis in fifth lead right now, every task force commander out there has used her. Uh, and her flexibility to focus on their mission area and to put their pieces of equipment on board to enable their mission and success in Fifth Fleet. So there's a, a, a birthing module. Is that like a shipping container? Pretty much, yep. Uh, most of these sets that come on, the, the whole aft part of the ship, about a third of the ship aft, is designed, anything you can put in a Connex box yep. is designed to go onto the ship, lock in, 
to the deck and then move out. So for any new technology, I know the Admiral mentioned a rapid insertion of technology. If you can put it in a Connex box, you can put it on an LCS. And uh, there's usually throughout the ship hookups for power because the ship yep. again was designed to be able to uh, maintain and put these new packages on power uh, cooling. So cooling uh, water to these locations as well as network connectivity. So a lot of flexibility in these platforms. Neat. Uh, Commodore Crawford from the Independence variant. Yeah, so uh, very similar to uh, Commodore Haney, we are uh, rolling out to single crew. We are just uh, uh, a little slower uh, because of the ships being deployed in blue gold. Um, but as we uh, go from blue gold, we'll go to 112 as our crew size as well. And there, there are some benefits. In addition to what uh, Commodore Haney mentioned, we are increasing the self-sufficiency uh, of the crews, not just from a maintainer uh, standpoint, but also from an administrative, a logistics um, uh, supply. Um, there's, there's other capabilities that are going to be added to these crews uh, that will require them to rely less upon the LCS ROM who have historically supported a lot of those functions and tasks. And so uh, we are building into these crews to help them to be able to do these things on their own and, um, and giving them the resourcing to do so. I would also tell you that, um, and I'm going to go back as a, uh, in, in previous days, I was the surf pack N7, so the fleet uh, force training officer. And um, and so the single crew uh, uh, initiative has a benefit for the rest of the fleet, too. When you look at when you have uh, half of the number of crews that you had to train before, um, that increases the availability of the training resources in the fleet, whether it be at the ATGs or at Strike Group 15 or Strike Group 4, um, to be available to train the the other ships on the waterfront. And and so it's not just benefiting the LCS crews, but also the rest of the waterfront. Uh, fewer crews to train. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Uh, hey, Bill, for me, it's culture, right? You know, it, it's a strategic shift that when you own your ship, you know, for me, I'm all about ownership, right? It, you know, my 16-year-old stepson, Davis, he owns his car. Hey, this is your car. You own it. You maintain it. It's yours. And, you know, these aren't SSBNs and we don't have NR, you know, driving down what we do. And, and that's a proven model. I mean, they're one of the best institutions in the world. Uh, and not to say the rest of the Navy isn't, but not everything's resourced to that level. And I just, um, when I got here 20 something months ago, there was still a discussion, hey, we're going to go single crew, we blew gold, and, like, and there's a whole bunch of trade-offs to them. A sub O is a big one, you know, availability uh, on deployment. Um, but ultimately, I think culture wins out. And there's a cost of effect. I mean, right now, we have a fairly significant um, uh, reduction in sailors across across the entire Navy. Right. Um, so um, it's hard to justify doing blue gold on one one class of ship and not the others. The number though of 112 is important because it's not to operate the ship. Uh, I would argue it's about the total sustainment of the ship. So it's um, so if you send a diesel engineman to diesel school to get uh, A and C school to be able to to repair the diesel, not just operate it, but repair it that gap in time with that sailor gone, you need to be able to be in four section duty. You need to be able to have fire duty sections. You need to, all the other things that we do with warships, these ships need. And so that's where that network came from. We had several manning summits. We worked with uh, CNA, Center for Naval Analysis, to do a study. Um, and then it's about fighting the ship. Uh, and when you look back at the USS Cole, you look at the Princeton, you look at what happened with other uh, incidents we've had in the Navy when a crew has to respond to to casualties and fighting it and flooding and fire. Uh, you pick anything uh, in recent memory. You need a lot of people and being optimally manned might work in the business world uh, yeah. where, you know, but when you're working with a U.S. warship, uh, it's not optimum. You need to be manned. And I think 112 is going to be a good number for us. Yeah, that, that we were just having a conversation uh, on that topic yesterday with our editorial board and and uh, noting the fact that uh, over the last few years has really been a shift. It, it's not just uh, in the business world, but, you know, now the, the Navy's really on board with this idea that, 
you're you, you got to get away from cost reduction and and um, uh, and really think about resiliency and redundancy and sufficiency and all of those things that maybe in in times of real lean budgets when you're focused on you know the centcom mission and supply and csgs for uh, for you know operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, you can think about being lean, right? That lean six sigma kind of talk. But when you're talking about high end fight, and you're talking about peer competition at sea. You really, you know, to your point about damage control and fighting the ship, that 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 starts to weigh much more heavily. But I also don't want people to think, oh well, LCS can only, you know, it's the Danish Navy; it can only get underway for two days, or it only gets. No, I mean we just had. I think Mark was at Charleston, 39 straight days at sea. Uh, uh, Manchester had um, uh, 35 uh, straight days underway, which is uh, really remarkable when you look at it, what they, the stores capability that they have on board. But then, but Charleston, sir, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned Charleston. I mean, 26 month deployment, uh, a single ship deployed for 26 months, never been done before, and so. Uh, and she performed remarkably. Her her operational availability was in uh, the mid 90s uh, for that 26 months while she was gone. OK, uh, so uh, for Commodore Haney, um, we, we talked a little bit about this maintenance um, uh, engagement teams and, and moving to this sailor self-sufficiency. But can you can you talk a little bit about um, how uh, re not re yeah the uh, uh, ship's availability are you seeing the feedback already are you seeing that that that's actually uh, you know driving to the ships being more available more often well, I think a lot of these initiatives are still coming out right I think uh, what we've talked about and what you mentioned about the Navy making a change and saying hey we really do need to invest in this is a little bit of a sea change for the class that we've really within the last maybe six months have really been doubling down on uh, yeah. this idea of returning to more traditional mindset. Uh, the class, I think, has been looking for this for a while, and I think we finally admitted to ourselves uh, what we need to do. We need to make these ships traditional warships and give the capability back to the sailors to be able to operate their ships. Uh, I know, you know, there was a lot of a vision originally. Uh, but we're very, very little reliance on contractors now for maintaining the ships. I mean, 75 percent of the PMS is done by the sailors, uh, ship's crew, and then uh, the vast majority of the rest of that's made up by the, the maintenance uh, execution teams that you mentioned. Uh, again, Navy owned, and that's where the ownership comes in, too, is having the pride in owner, ownership of these ships. Uh, we've kept them downrange longer. We've given more capability, and we're actually really... Uh, investing in that reliability for the ship class. One thing we didn't do very well either was uh, give the parts and pieces on the ship because we had that original vision uh, and we've taken an Indianapolis deployment, and this is specific for the Freedom class, a year plus deployment still in Fifth Fleet and very rapidly took analysis of their uh, supply usage and parts and pieces and where their casualties were. And then for the next deployer, we're inserting that those uh, parts and pieces to have that on board the ship. And so really, yeah. for the first time, we'll give the sailors the capability to maintain themselves and the traditional feedback loop that the supply community has been using for years to try to refine and learn on a traditional ship we weren't doing. And so now we've kind of jump started that and we'll uh, for the rest of uh, for every next deployer, we're going to refine that. And again, given the capability of the sailors to maintain their ship at sea in support of the fleet. Got it. Uh, back to independence class and the mine countermeasures mission for a minute. Uh, at the top of the show, the uh, Admiral Leclerc, you mentioned that it'd be you know soon that the first MCM package would go on a, one of the the ships out there and and be preparing for deployment. When do you see the first independence class with that MCM package on board, you know, headed to either Fifth Fleet or Seventh Fleet for an extended deployment? Uh, I next year, I, I won't say when, but got it. Okay. Say 2025. Next, next 2025. Um, those mission packages are delivering now. Um, they're being when we get them. Um, the PMS 420 is the program office at NAVC that that gets them and puts them together. And and there's some adjustments that have to be made and then refinished and and. Uh, but you'll, we're, we're doing that now, and uh, the integration into the ships is happening this year and the training, and then you'll see those deployments starting. Uh, 
that we are laser, laser, laser focused on that task. Uh, that is a no fail mission um, to be able to do that. And, uh, and, and that's the, you know, I, I'm confident that we're going to get there, but that has my full attention as well as uh, uh, the rest of the team. Uh, are you getting, you know, is industry actually building those mission packages fast enough now? Or are they, are you, are they getting them to you so that you can start to integrate them in the ships? They are. In fact, in FC, we worked with Admiral Smith and his team, and uh, there was a few hiccups when we did the testing uh, two years ago. There were some things that we got out of that testing, which proves the value in testing, that we wanted to make some modifications to the package. So we went back to the vendor to say, hey, we want to make these changes, which, again, put more onus on them, right? And uh, But we decided to do it, that it was better to do that now instead of deploying something that was maybe not as good as we wanted. Uh, so that added a little bit of time. Uh, we also found uh, we have a, a, an interesting thing on, on both ships, which is really kind of a, a cool technology. We um, we took the the cranes or the da- davits, if you will, and we they're in the inside of the ship. So, you know, one of the water, you know, salt water, corrosion, all those things make maintenance of those brutal. But we did that. And so on on the independence class is the T-Beck which is a twin boom extended crane. This thing is massive and it can crane like 21,000 pounds. Uh, but it, it, they're, they're low, you know, when you fully fill the USB full of fuel, we realize, you know what, it's really at the limit. So we're going to make some improvements there as well. Uh, but, but we're on a good path. Uh, we're really excited about uh, what we're doing there. The testing we did was great last year to IOC it. And I think we're uh, on a good path um, to meet mission next year. All right, Mark, can uh, you add to that, Crawford, or is that capture it pretty well? No, Admiral, you 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 captured it well, and and the industry partners have really been teaming with us, uh, and not just here in San Diego, but also in Panama City, as as we as we get this these new systems, uh, developing the tactics and techniques and procedures for how we're going to employ them uh, in in various environments. Uh, so industry has been right there with us every step of the way, and they've been great teammates. Good, good. Uh, we're running a little short on time here, so I want to wrap up by talking about the uh, officers and sailors who serve on the ships. Uh, what's different about uh, how the detailing process uh, happens to LCSs and, and the types of folks who you want on uh, either the Freedoms or the Independence class? Hey, I'll, I'll kick just, that off, sir. I'll hey, think Mark, that, uh, you, you go. I think uh, first off, uh, LCS sailors are highly trained sailors uh, due to the small number of the crew members. uh, They go through very specialized training and actually multiple schools that would normally be spread across other sailors on a traditional ship. So highly trained. Uh, I think the officers on board, the service warfare officers, they go through uh, probably the best training, navigation, ship handling training the Navy has. And for those young ensigns that step on board the ship, I, I think that's there's no better place for a Navy SWO to learn their trade than on the deck of an LCS because of the training you get and then also the the ownership you get and what's the, expected of you as a junior officer on an LCS is much higher than it is probably on a more traditional ship that has more a larger wardroom. You you will be part of the team and every sailor on an LCS needs to be uh, somebody that's rowing on that ship. And so uh, we need high performing sailors and we need sailors that enjoy a challenge, but also want to be part of a very motivated and skilled team uh, that, you know, who wants to have the success of that team on their shoulders as well. So our our, our first tour swoes detailed to LCSs, or is it just a second division officer tours? Uh, yes, sir. We're getting, uh, usually each ship gets about four ensigns now okay. on board to get their swoop ins. And like I said, yeah, I think the independence, there's no better place. Yeah, the independence variant gets uh, three uh, ensigns uh, as it's currently uh, programmed, and and that may expand as we go to 112. But I, I echo Mark Haney's, uh, you know, we want motivated uh, sailors that are are um, motivated and and willing to put in the work, but also uh, willing to lead sailors and and do what is necessary. We want. Um, we want officers and and uh, and enlisted sailors who are creative as we look to expand the tactical boundaries and and operate in a non-traditional naval uh, environment that you know vastly different than what 
uh, previous generations have uh, seen when we look at uh, naval warfare. And and so we want that creativity. We want those innovative ideas. And uh, but you got to be willing to lead and you got to be willing to step up. And and as uh, Commodore Haiti mentioned, the training bar none is is the best around in, in the U.S. Navy. All right. Yeah, Bill, hey, Bill, what's different real quick? When I was when I was a young ensign, I mean, I'm on the bridge and I'm giving you know rudder orders and commands to a helmsman. Uh, they're literally sitting in a chair driving the ship themselves, and it's 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 like a spaceship. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible on the bridge. Cool. Send some pictures of that. We will. Well, we are uh, about out of time. Uh, I'll give you very quickly if anybody has any saved rounds or things I should have asked that we didn't get to talk to. Uh, starting hey, with Commodore, I'll, I'll start with ahead. Commodore you Haney. Guys. Oh, sorry, we're stepping on each other. Sorry, sir. No, it's okay, go ahead. I'll, I'll go with Commodore Haney first, and then Commodore Crawford, and then uh, back to the Admiral. I'll just say, sir, when a Freedom LCS shows up into your theater, the task force commander has a very capable surface command and a very capable warship. I mean, where we come to the table with, and you'll get it for both class, 57 millimeter guns, surface to surface mission module, which is longbow hellfire, uh, Romeo helicopter standard. And then you get the flexibility that is built into the platform to add what you need as a task force commander to execute your mission in theater. So a great capability in these ships and having served on one as a commanding officer and having the pleasure to serve as one as Commodore and uh, continue to lead it into the next phase. Uh, it's amazing and exciting for me. So I'm loving it. OK, great. Uh, Commodore Crawford. Yes. Uh, so, Bill, I've been uh, an LCS Commodore for four years now, and and this is the pinnacle of my career. And and it's really amazing to see where we are today versus where we were and and the innovations and, and, the, and the strides that we continue to make. And and the fact that we are looking at LCS presence now, we're talking about LCS presence in theater. And it's not an afterthought. It is an intentional conversation that is that our fleet commanders are wanting to have because they value uh, what LCS brings to the table. And so, um, yeah, just super excited for what is going on right now and and what will happen in the years to come. Well, I'll make a plug for all of you uh, that as your crews, your officers, as you continue to develop new tactics and use these platforms in new ways, we want to we want articles for proceedings about that. Um, and, and it could be as simple as one of my favorite types of articles we call a professional note. And we've got a long history starting uh, in recent decades uh, when when uh, commander then commander Stavridis uh, commanded one of the first DDGs. He wrote a ship handling prof note for us about how to handle the DDG. I haven't had a uh, either for either classes how to handle the freedom or how to handle an independence class uh, LCS, but would love to have uh, you know just basic 1500 words on ship handling. What are some tricks of the trade with both those ships? So, uh, but any other topics would be terrific too, from tactical employment, you know, new capabilities. We want to hear it. Well, absolutely. Hey, Bill, yeah, hey Bill, I'll add uh, a couple of quick points and very quick. I'll try. So what I have here is the testimony from uh, Nicholas Gerton, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Research Development Acquisition. And I'm reading through his small service combatant section. And I was thrilled to hear he talked about air, uh, uncrewed aircraft uh, system, UAS. What was amazing about that is that we, we saw this system in January of last year at SNA and in 11 months fielded them on several of the UA, uh, on LCS ships. Why it mattered for LCS is because when you put a Arisan UAS on there, we can launch it with three people instead of an entire crew that you would take to do that. Because again, we talked about how small the crew is, but what does that UAS give you? 11 hours in the air, 11 pounds of JP5. Um, it has full motion video. You can put a ton of other things on there we can't talk about on this net and it's proven, it works. And and what you don't have to do is have an entire air den on there. And I love helicopters and pilots and the crews, but it's 20, <laughs> but it's 25 sailors, and we get a very similar capability for a lot less stress on the ship. We have to continue to experiment that way with other things. And we already are, um, and we don't have enough time to talk about them all. The trick is that, you know, we 
we just have to continue to do it and continue to invest in the ships uh, because we need to. And I think for the listeners, again, the original strategy that was devised years ago didn't take in the normal considerations that we do for DDGs or anything. So anytime there's ever been a bad news story about the ships, what what they need to take into account that they never got what maybe other traditional ships would have gotten like DDGs. I was on USS Jackson last week, single crewed uh, independence variant uh, LCS six. The crew was unbelievable. They've been deployed twice together. They're getting ready to go on deployment again here to Tahiti and the seasoned veterans, the knowledge of the ship, their ability to fix it, uh, the solutions they've come up with on their own. It, it, if people watching this could have been there and seen them and, and unbelievable. And I tell everybody, the most important two things in our country that are on this ship are U.S. sailors and the American flag. And, and again, we keep saying ship. People who don't know them need to go to them and see them and visit them. They can talk, contact me here in San Diego. I can get them a visit of LCS either out here or we can do it down in Mayport. And I think they themselves, when they tour the ship, when they see what they are, they're going to walk away feeling really good about what we've produced as a Navy. And uh, we just got to continue to do that. And so I want to thank you because the opportunity of podcasts like this with a credible organization, you know, a highly thought of institution like yours gives us an opportunity to share that message. And, uh, and I challenge people to come out here and hang with us and come see what these are because they'd really be proud of the sailors, uh, what they're doing and what the ships are doing. So I appreciate the opportunity. Well, next year when I come out there for West, I want to stop by and uh, and actually go on board one of the Independence class. And no, we're going to fly to be- you. We're going to fly you in a UAV out to one. We're going to strap you to one and land you, and so you can be. It's no, we're going to put you on a helo and we'll take you out <laughs> and ride the ship. That'd be great. That would be fantastic. We're going to do it. Thank All right. You so much. Well, my guests today have been Rear Admiral Ted Leclerc, Director of Task Force Littoral Combat Ship. Captain Mark Crawford, the Commander LCS Squadron 1, and Captain Mark Haney, Commander LCS Squadron 2. Gentlemen, thanks for your time. I've learned a lot. Today's show has been brought to you by Valletta Industries, a premier maritime tactical training company founded and comprised of former U.S. Navy SEALs. Valletta offers best-in-class trainers for the Department of Defense, local law enforcement, and U.S. citizens. The Valletta team has a passion for instructing and continuing to support the mission of active duty personnel and first responders by lending their hard-earned experience to those brave Americans who still serve. If you're a government contractor looking for a partner for your next big project, Valletta Industries is an SBA certified hub zone and SDVOSB company. Valletta Industries, we solve problems. To learn more, go to www.vallettaindustries.com. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.